Good morning. I didn't hear anybody. Good morning. Why don't we all stand? There you go. If we have to stand, you guys have to stand. It's only fair. Um, I was reading something this morning in Psalm uh, 96, and it says, Say to the nations, the Lord reigns. And I was just thinking, that's what we're here to do. We're here to proclaim that God is king. And when God is king and when we worship that and we proclaim that, good things happen. People are drawn to him and he's glorified. So worship with us as we sing. directors here. The other one is this guy right here. And we just want to extend a special welcome to you all this morning. Um, I see a lot of new faces out there, so I hope that you're blessed by our service. 
If this is your first time, we invite you to fill out one of these connection cards there in the seat in front of you. And just give us a little bit of information about you um, so we can share what we're doing here at Crosspoint and how we can serve you and minister to you and your family. So also on the back, there's uh, room for prayer requests, praises, and we love to celebrate and to pray on your behalf as well. So we invite you to fill that out. Um, as many of you know, our youth group is going to Africa in like less than six weeks. It's crazy how quick it's coming. Uh, we have nine students and seven adults traveling. And so there has been a lot of buildup, and yet <laughs> we still have some funds to raise. And so um, this Friday, September 22nd, we have a really great spaghetti dinner, $5 a person, and um, it starts at 6.30. And so we invite you. Tickets are pre-sold. Out, we're out there um, in between and after services. So come buy a ticket. And if you cannot make it but would still like to support in some way, uh, we have a long list of items that we still need. So uh, we invite you to come and help us in that way. Uh, for now, why don't you guys go in the aisle way and welcome one another this morning. Good morning. I just love the hum of God's people. Love the hum of God's people. You, if you could take a seat, and if those that are joining this morning, uh, we get the privilege of Covenant Partner. I know we're not supposed to have favorite Sundays, um, but next to Communion Sunday, this is probably one of my favorite Sundays. If you are making profession of faith this morning, or are, uh, are part of our covenant, last Covenant Partner pl class, if you could join Kaylin and I up here. It is um, an incredible opportunity and privilege uh, to get to hear God's stories as written through his people. And about, I don't know, three or four weeks ago, Pastor Brian, we had a class, and um, they're all incredible, um, incredible opportunities. And this past one was no exception. And I think one of the things that I was blessed about, if you are a mentor also, if you are, were a mentor of one of these youth, if you could join us up here as well. Um, one of uh, the exciting things in this last one really was to see God um, connect us together through generations and to have those that are making profession of faith join us as well. And I'm going to come stand right here because this is the first time I had the privilege of being someone's mentor and it was an incredible, incredible blessing uh, to walk alongside her in this journey. So if any of you out here would like to be one of those, I'm sure Danny and Kaylin would love to, uh, yeah, would love to know that. It's an incredible opportunity, and God grows us in the process. But this was an incredible class. And so, um, as you can see, God is blessing our uh, prayer for to be a church of all nations. Amen? Is this a beautiful picture of God's family? A beautiful picture of God's family. So I am going to um, pass the microphone down because I will not correctly pronounce some of the last names. <laughs> So if you could introduce yourself 
And then in, um, wow, in a minute or less, if you could um, maybe answer the question, what stirred in, here, stirred in you uh, to make this next step, whether it's to declare Cross Point as your family or to make profession of faith, uh, what stirred in you uh, to do that? Uh, Pastor Brian and some of the elders and myself got the privilege of hearing that, uh, but not um, everyone. Uh, these people need to hear too. So introduce yourself and then maybe what prompted you to make that next step and whether you are transferring or making profession of faith, okay? Hello, my name is Ruth Miner, and I became born again on uh, Saturday the 19th of last month. <laughs> With uh, such a decision, I decided to join a church so I could grow, and the Holy Spirit led me to Cross Point, uh, courtesy of Jane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, church. Yeah, I know I've been here for about almost, it will be four years in the month of May. And um, actually the first time I, I came here, I knew it was home. So uh, now I'm just doing the formality. I know I belong here. And the one thing that brought me here, I was looking for a place where we can be meeting in our, our prayer group. But uh, also I realized the Lord is reading me here, not just to be blessed, but to be a blessing. And so and, uh, I'm... I've been born again, I've become a Christian, I don't even remember, many, many years, I think it was 1984, so um, before that I was also a Christian, I was born uh, in a Christian home, but personally, when I confessed that I knew I have to be a Christian, this is your uh, Praise the Lord, church. Praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> yeah, my name is Nancy Maina. Uh, before I joined this church, I used to join, I was, I'm a member of MISPA ministry, so we used to have our worship in the, in the other room for the students. And after that, I went to Indiana, joined um, Baptist Church, uh, where Pastor Jelly was, is my pastor. And then when I came back in here, because this is where I need to settle, because Ruth is my daughter, and uh, Jane is a very close friend, I decided this is where I should do whatever I was going to do there. And then uh, I stayed the month of December without going to any church, because I was asking God, where do you really want me to go? And when I got an apartment uh, near Archibald, I felt I should come into this church for the first time, and when I came, I just felt I don't need to move anymore uh, because I felt and I asked uh, around that I had principles of faith and they are the ones I have. I was baptized in 1972 and I was saved in 1972. And may God bless you. Um, I'm Kelsey Sanders and I'm making profession of faith. And something inside me just told me that it was time to make the next step. I'm Ian Lamboy. Um, I'm professing my faith also, and uh, I felt like God was kind of tugging at my heart to um, make the next step in uh, my relationship with him. Um, I'm Chad Vandermillen, and I'm also doing profession of faith, and God just told me to stop going through the motions and profess my faith through him. I'm Alex Vandertag. Um, I went to Israel this summer and felt God pushing me to take the next step in my faith, so here I am now professing my faith. Hello, good morning all. Um, my name is Oris Joy, and this is my wife, Elizabeth. Um, we, we've been married about uh, a year and a couple of months now, and this is only a natural progression as she was born into and baptized and raised within the Christian uh, Reformed Church, and, and we've, she's always been a part of the church. She's employed by a Christian Reformed organization, and it's always a privilege and a honor to uh, be a part of uh, God's kingdom in any uh, way, shape, or form. And like I said, it's only a natural progression, and I'm very happy uh, to be here amongst you today because we are a young family and we need uh, the community of, 
uh, God's children to help us um, grow and remain more fervent in our faith. So I'm standing here before you to be, uh, to be formally um, uh, welcomed into your fold. Uh, my name is Katrina Sivisma, and this is my husband, David, and our son, Wesley. We've been going here for about five years, and... And the reason why we're here is because we wanted to officially make this church our family and also make uh, our commitment to God for ourselves and also for our son, who is going to be baptized today. So amazing. The angels are like partying right now, and we get to participate in that. So why don't we give them one more hand? For now, as a part of this process of becoming a, a member of this church and a part of professing your faith, uh, Danelle and I have a few questions to ask you. The first question, do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, accept the promises of God, and affirm the truth of the Christian faith, which is proclaimed in the Bible and confessed in this church of Christ? Do you believe that your children, though sinful by nature, are received by God in Christ as members of his covenant and therefore ought to be baptized? And these are the questions for baptism. So say. that's okay. Um, do you, the people of the Lord of... Uh, well, I'm not going to remember the questions, but do we have the questions? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Um, and the first question, and proclaim him to be Lord of your life and will follow the teachings of, of this church, um, the Church of Christ. The second question has to do with um, accepting your baptism. And the third question has to do with supporting this church with your gifts, with your tithes, uh, with uh, a community to serve, to be served, uh, and to follow the teachings of this church. And I'm not sure, are we going to get the questions? All right, well, why don't we just go down and answer. How do you respond? I respond yes to all. Yes. Yes to all. Yes. I do. Yes. I do. Yes, very well. I do, God help me. Yes. Yes. Welcome them to the family of Cross Point. One of the beautiful things about being a part of this covenant family is not what this family, and they will, what this family gets to pour into you, into you, but what you get to pour into us. We will be forever changed by the work of your hands, by the power of the Holy Spirit. One of the beautiful things um, about who God has created us each uniquely to be is that he has deposited something in each of you that will make us be more like him. And so thank you in advance and praise God in advance for who we will be as the body of Christ because of your contribution in being here. We all know that we respond. We cannot do it on our own, right? We respond just as we heard these profession of faiths. We respond to the work of the Holy Spirit, right? We do not do that on our own. And so thank you for responding to the work of the Holy Spirit and for being a part of this body. I encourage you to get to know them. It's not whether you are four months old or three months old or whether you are older than dirt. <laughs> whether you're 15 or 16, you have a contribution to make. You are significant because God has brought you here and chosen you to be his representative and be Bring the kingdom, be the kingdom, live the gospel today. Thank you, mentors, for what you have done, what you have done to pour into these youth. Uh, Kaylin and I would like to pray over you and kind of pray a ceiling over that. Uh, so if we could kind of stand down here, because I would like the parents of those who are making profession of faith to join us, and then Kaylin is going to lead us in a prayer. Can we do that? And the parents of those making profession of faith. And church family, if you want to raise a hand towards this group, uh, we welcome you to do that as well. 
Let's pray. Father God, um, right this minute, there's a party going on in heaven, and we just join with the angels in celebrating um, just the growth of your body and um, the new people who are just entering your kingdom even here on earth, Lord. And so we celebrate. We're filled with joy and excitement for the lives of these people who have said yes to you and have committed to live their life um, in your will, God. And so, um, God, we just lift these people up to you. We know that when people choose you, the enemy is close at hand. And so, God, we pray that you would protect them. God, continue to grow them. Give them wisdom for those who are parents, Lord. Um, may you give them strength. And just speak into their lives as they um, speak into the lives of their family members. God, for those who are youth, um, just so exciting to see young people come to you, God. And so I pray... Lord, that you would protect them, that you would continue to grow them and disciple them, Lord, as they learn what it means to be a follower of you. Um, God, just thank you. We're celebrating right now the lives of these people. And Father God, we would pray a sealing of the work, Father, that you have begun in them. Father, that you would guard them, that you would protect them, that you would draw them near to you, nearer to you. Father, we pray for us as a body, as a family, Father, that we would uh, walk along with them, Father, that uh, as they bless us, that we would bless them. And Father, that by the work of the Holy Spirit, in and through and around us, Father, that we would be forever changed. We praise you in advance uh, for the work of your hands uh, through your humble servants. Father, may you continue to use us, to grow us, and Father, to bless us with your incredible, amazing, precious presence. And I pray, Father, that presence um, in all these beautiful people here. Thank you for being a God who is faithful to all generations and who answers prayers. We love you. We continue to worship you. And Father, we just praise you for who you are. And all God's people said, amen. We're going to continue uh, in the celebration of baptism. That works. The Sebasma family gets to stay on stage here a little bit longer. What a great privilege it is to be able to baptize Wesley. He's sleeping right now. <laughs> it's been great to get to know David and Katrina. Uh, David is a big part of our uh, basketball team that goes into the men's prison every couple of months. Uh, you can see David's a little taller than me. And he's a very good basketball player. He's a big part of that ministry, and it's been great to get to know him and Katrina through that as well. And we got to hear their testimony at that covenant partner class. And really, what a miracle Wesley is, uh, a miracle baby and a gift from the Lord. And, and so it's a great privilege to baptize him this morning. And baptism of infants is really about God's promises. It's about that God is a promise keeping God, not to just us as adults, but also to our children. And we can see that all the way through scripture. Uh, we can go back to Genesis when God called Abraham out of his own land and God made some promises to Abraham. And, and he said, I'm gonna be your God, Abraham, and your descendants are going to be my people and I will always be your God. And God said to Abraham, as a sign of that promise, uh, that sign is going to be circumcision. And all male children need to be circumcised uh, to remind you of my promise to be your God. Well, if you fast forward, that, that circumcision is, uh, is an act where there's blood and that foreshadows the work of Jesus on the cross. And, and so Jesus in the new covenant um, uh, instituted baptism in place of circumcision as the sign of God's covenant. And so as we baptize Wyatt this, or Wesley this morning, uh, God is saying, my promises, Wesley, are for you just as they are to your dad, David, and to your mom, Katrina, and to me and to you. 
And so uh, it's really about what a faithful God he is and about his promises. And so uh, we know that we have the questions for the baptism <laughs> up on the screen. If you can, uh, so I'm gonna ask you guys these questions as parents uh, of Wesley. David and Katrina, do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you accept the promises of God and affirm the truth of the Christian faith which is proclaimed in the Bible and confessed in this church of Christ? Do you believe that your child, Wesley Wyatt Sebasma, though sinful by nature, is received by God in Christ as a member of his covenant family and therefore ought to be baptized? And so let me ask you, uh, what is your answer to that question, those questions, David and Katrina? And you, as a community of faith, this is the be beautiful thing about what we call covenantal theology, is that raising Wesley to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior and to learn the promises of God is not just something that we say, well, David and Katrina, can, you know, this is great. Hope it goes well for you, okay? We have a part in that. We have a part in that. And you as a community of faith play a part in that as well. And so I want to ask you, uh, the congregation, do you, the people of the Lord, promise to receive Wesley in love, pray for him, help instruct him in the faith, and encourage and sustain him in the fellowship of this community of faith? What is your answer, congregation? Amen. And that is a great gift from the Lord. And so we look forward to walking alongside of you guys in this journey of faith and to watch Wesley be raised to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And maybe one day we trust that there will be a day when Wesley will be on this stage or some stage as these young people were ready to say, I profess Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Amen. And we'll pray for that day. All right, well, this is a, a great moment, and let's uh, come over here and pray that we don't wake him up. <laughs> Wesley Wyatt Sebasma, I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let me pray for you guys. Father, thank you for this family and thank you for bringing them to Cross Point and God for really the miracle of Wesley, uh, the gift that this life is to this family and to this body of believers. Thank you for this incredible gift of baptism that encourages us as a community of faith, this sacrament that you have given to us uh, to remind us of uh, the washing away of our sins, the promises of God that points us to the cross of Jesus Christ. And we thank you for this incredible gift. And we pray, uh, God, that your Holy Spirit would already begin to do a work in Wesley and that you would use David and Katrina and that you would use us as a community of faith to walk alongside of him, to teach him, to disciple him, to know Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And God, we trust in your promises. We trust that there will be a day when Wesley will stand before a body uh, of believers and say, I, Jesus is my Savior. He's my Lord. He's, he, it's not just my parents' faith. It's my faith. And so, God, we praise you in advance for that day uh, that we trust will come. And so, God, uh, we just pray that your Holy Spirit would move in his heart, that your Holy Spirit would do a work in him. And we look forward, God, to what you have for this young boy, uh, Wesley Wyatt Sebasima. And all God's people said, amen. Man. i 
that you're in our midst, God. We thank you that we see people coming to proclaim that you're king, God. We see students being raised up who are saying yes, God. And that's because you are real, God, and you're moving. And so we just want to praise you, God, for your faithfulness, God. We want to praise you for who you are, for what you've done for us, God. God, as we just continue to to worship you, God, and as we get into your word, God, we just pray that you would just make yourself known, God. We just want to praise you and sing of how marvelous and how wonderful, God, you are. So continue to be with us. You can be seated. At this time, our deacons are going to come forward and we'll receive this morning's offering. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned, unclean, singing how marvelous.
Father, we do uh, just proclaim what a marvelous God you are. We marvel at the depth of your love for us, Father. God, and I believe we saw a picture of that love this morning um, in the people that you are bringing to Cross Point, in the young people as Danny prayed that you have uh, placed your spirit in to bring them to a place where they say, I want to profess my faith in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. God, we know that that is only something that your Holy Spirit does. Words, songs from a human level can't move someone's heart, but your Spirit does. And so, God, we just proclaim what a marvelous God you are this morning. Another word that comes to my mind, God, is what a faithful God you are. I'm reminded this morning of several years ago how the leaders of this church, the elders and the deacons, stood on the fountain outside in a big circle, a fountain that proclaims the the passage from Scripture, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I've commanded. And we stood around that fountain, and we prayed, God, that you would bring the nations. And we see your faithfulness in that. God, that we desire to be a church that disciples people and that sends people out, that the nations can come here and encounter a living and true God. So we praise you this morning that you're a faithful God, that you're a true God, and we worship you. God, we know that you're faithful too in your word. Your word says that when your word goes forward, it does, not return, it does not return void. It fulfills your purposes. And so, God, as we now turn to your word, uh, we pray that your Holy Spirit would fulfill your purposes. God, that you would stir in our hearts, that you would move in us to see Jesus, to grow in our love for you, to be brought to a, a level of deeper commitment because of that marvelous love that you showed for us on the cross. So God, have your way with us as we turn to your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, anytime that we have Covenant Partner Sunday, it's a good morning, amen? And anytime we have young people or old people or in between people professing faith in Jesus Christ. It's a good Sunday, amen? So it's good to be here with you guys. It's good to have family uh, and friends of those who have joined this morning uh, visiting with us, so welcome to Cross Point. For some of you, it's a coming home, I know. Uh, for others of you, maybe this is your first time here, and, and we want to say welcome to you as well. We have been, as a church, going through the Beatitudes uh, for the last month and a half or so, and we'll continue for a little while. And the series is called The Good Life. And so if you would turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, That's the first book in what we call the New Testament in our Bibles, Matthew chapter 5. We've been encouraging each other to memorize this passage that we know as the Beatitudes, Matthew 5 verses 1 through 12, and want to keep encouraging you in that. And uh, last week too, uh, many of us committed to Uh, seek the Lord in a time of fasting for the next uh, six and a half weeks or so and just want to encourage you in that. Maybe this morning you've, uh, you went, oh man, I did commit to that and I forgot. You know, that happens. It's not too late to kind of pick that up and, and uh, join us in that as we hunger and thirst for God as his people. So let's stand. We'll read uh, uh, here at Cross Point when we read from the text. We stand together to honor God's word and I'm going to read verses 1 through 12 and you can follow along on the screen or in your Bibles. Verse 1, now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. 
his disciples came to him and he began to teach them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And notice that verse 3 Uh, and verse 10, both end with that theirs is the kingdom of heaven, right? So it's book book ended with that phrase kingdom of heaven that puts it in the context of God's kingdom. Verse 11, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You can be seated. So just as a reminder of a few things about these statements that we call Beatitudes, and we call them Beatitudes because they all begin with that same word blessed or blessed, right? And we've talked about that word. It comes from the Greek word makarios, and it means happiness, but not happiness in in the sense of an emotion like we think of happiness, like I'm happy this morning because my son made profession of faith, okay? Not that kind of happiness. It's a, it's a spiritual state that exists because God's favor has come upon us, okay? And so the Beatitudes, these statements of Jesus are not conditions. They are not statements that say, when you meet this condition, you will experience the favor of God. That's not what the Beatitudes are. They're not conditions and rewards. The Beatitudes are a description of a community of people that have experienced the favor of God. The kingdom of heaven has come upon them. And and we've talked about the importance of placing these Beatitudes in the greater context of God's kingdom and the kingdom coming in the person of Jesus Christ and the kingdom coming as Jesus heals people, as he delivers people, as he forgives people, as he loves people, and as the kingdom of heaven comes upon people and their hearts are radically changed, they, are, they become a part of this community of the blessed ones. And so that's uh, what this passage, these passages are about. It's a description of this community of people that have been radically changed and they become a part of God's kingdom. They become into relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And so we've been working our way through the, one a week and, and this morning we come to verse 8. The beatitude that says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. That's where we turn our focus to this morning, verse 8. And it's interesting, as I was reading different uh, commentators or different writers uh, that, that uh, talk about this passage or this particular beatitude, they talk about how, in some ways, this is the most difficult beatitude to, to describe. And so we're going to take a stab at it this morning and, and pray that God's word does not return void, right? We know that that will not happen, and so we'll trust that God will do a work through it. Uh, Let's do a a little bit of a word study here. The Greek word that we translate as pure is katharos, katharos. And it means literally free from stain, free from blemish. It means unadulterated. It means unmixed. Nothing is added to it. And so when you think of the opposite of pure, pure, the opposite of pure then is something that has many elements to it or something that has, I'll use the word ingredients, right? Multiple ingredients. Well, pure is unadulterated. Pure is unblemished. Pure is unmixed. And so the literal translation of that is, 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 is that. As used by Jesus, In this beatitude, he's talking about being unmixed in our devotion to God, and we'll talk more about that as we work our way through this message. It's about being single-minded, an undivided heart. So that's the word that we translate as pure. The word that we translate as, as heart in the Greek is cardia, very similar to our word cardiac, right? 
in the, in the uh, kind of the Western view of a heart, we think of heart as other than the organ inside of us, we think of it as kind of an emotion, right? If I say I have a broken heart this morning, you're going to say, oh, Brian is sad. He has the emotion of sadness, right? Well, that's not really what Jesus is getting at here when he talks about the heart. From a Hebrew perspective or from an Eastern perspective, the heart is the seat of everything. It's the inner core of the person. And so the heart encompasses our emotions, but it also encompasses our intellect, our mind. It encompasses our decision-making or our will. It's really the the seat of everything. It's the inner core of the person. And so Jesus in this beatitude then is speaking about one who exhibits a single-mindedness from the very core of his being. Okay? An unmixed heart from the very core of his being. And we'll see later that it really means a, a undivided devotion to the Lord. Okay? Well, as we, if you're visiting this morning, as we've been working our way through these statements, these beatitudes, we've been asking two kind of guiding questions. And the first question is, to whom is the kingdom of heaven available? Again, we're making sure we're putting it in the context of God's kingdom. So the first question that the Beatitudes cause us to ask is, to whom is the kingdom of heaven available? The Beatitudes, in one sense, are an invitation into the life of the kingdom, into the life with King Jesus. And so let's kind of take a look at that question first. To whom is the kingdom of heaven available? And I think to understand what Jesus is getting at here, we need to, for a few moments, we need to put on our Hebrew hats and we need to put on our Jewish ears, okay? And we need to put ourselves into the context of Jesus's audience. What would they have heard when Jesus made the statement, blessed are the pure in heart? What would they have heard? Well, likely they would have been brought back to maybe a couple of Old Testament passages, right? We've been saying that these Beatitudes are not just statements that Jesus pulls out of the thin air. In many of the Beatitudes, they are statements that come from the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament. And sure enough, here the audience probably would have been, oh, pure in heart. That goes back to Psalm chapter 24, verses 3 and 4. And this is a Psalm of David. Listen to this. It's up on the screen too. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord, David says? Who may stand in his holy place? In other words, who can come into the presence of God, into the presence of a holy God? He who has clean hands and a pure what? Hearts, right? Who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false? Well, by the time of Jesus, there was a tremendous emphasis in the culture on clean hands. More so than there was an emphasis on a pure heart. Especially maybe in the the realm of the religious leaders, there was such an incredible emphasis on having clean hands. This external cleanliness, okay? Have you guys ever heard of the Mishnah? The Mishnah is a, is a, it's a collection of, of sayings or rulings that someone put to a written record. And those sayings or rulings are from the rabbis, from the teachers uh, around Jesus' time. A couple hundred years before Jesus, during Jesus' time, and then a couple hundred years afterwards. Well, the Mishnah has some really interesting things to, to say, and it gives us an, a, a, a better picture of what the culture was like concerning clean hands. The Mishnah has over 200 pages, 200 pages devoted solely to external cleanliness, okay? The Mishnah describes cleanliness of utensils, like eating utensils, drinking utensils, uh, cleanliness of tents, cleanliness of mikvahs, which were the, uh, the ceremonial immersion baths, right, that what people would go down into, Uh, cleanliness of hands, but nothing about cleanliness of hearts. Listen to a a few uh, of examples that I found in the Mishnah. We had kind of a fun time as a family this past week. I was telling them about some of this stuff. Listen to this, what it talks about clean hands. Whoever eats bread 
without first washing his hands is, the, is as though he had sinned with a harlot. Wow, that's pretty serious, isn't it? Right? If you don't wash your hands before you eat the bread, it's just like you sinned with a harlot, okay? Whoever makes light of washing his hands will be uprooted from the world. Whoever eats bread without scouring his hands is as though he eats unclean bread. They even had a prayer of benediction that they would pray as they were washing their hands. It went like this. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by thy commandments and commanded us concerning the washing of hands. That was a benediction or a prayer that they would say. One more example. Washing of the hands was required immediately upon rising from the bed in the morning. It was supposed to be the first thing you did. And here's what it says. A hand which touches any part of the body without having first been washed on waking in the morning deserves to be cut off. Man, yeah. The hands remain in that dangerous condition until a person washes them three times, okay? That's just a small example of what the Mishnah, the writings of the Jewish teachers around the time of Jesus would say and teach the people. And so you get the idea that external cleanliness was a big deal in the, in the people around, the, in, the, in the culture of the Israelite people at the time of Jesus. And that came from the religious leaders, mostly known as the Pharisees. But I believe there, for many of them, their intent was right. Their desire was to be in a right relationship with the Lord, and, but it kind of got to the point where the external cleanliness, they, they thought the, the cleaner they were on the outside, that would make their heart clean. But Jesus turns that upside down. Look what he says to the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23. You want to read a serious passage of scripture, read all of Matthew 23 on your time. This is uh, just a couple of verses where Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. He says, You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside. Oh, you're so clean on the outside. But on the inside, you are full of dead man's bones and everything unclean. And then Jesus explains that. In the same way, he says, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous. You look great on the outside, Pharisees. But on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. The time of Jesus, if you were listening in that audience and you heard the words pure in heart, especially if you're a Pharisee, you were like, yeah, I know all about being pure. You can stop at the word pure though, Jesus. Don't go to the heart, okay? And Jesus takes it to the heart and he, he flips the, the, the teachings and he flips the attitudes of the culture on its head and he says, my kingdom is different. My kingdom is not about external cleanliness. My kingdom is about clean hearts. And so if you were a listener on that day and he says, blessed are the pure in heart, Who is he addressing? Who is he inviting into his kingdom? To whom is the kingdom of heaven available? I think two different types of people. Two different types of people. The first is that listener who is sitting there and maybe thinking to himself or herself, man, I haven't been able to keep the ceremonial law. I haven't been able to wash my hands. I haven't been very good at that. Man, I failed at that. For whatever reason, maybe I just don't have the energy to do that, to keep up with all of these requirements, all of these legalistic requirements. Or maybe I didn't have access to water like some do, whatever the reason was, and I'm looked down upon by my community and I'm looked down upon by the religious leaders. As I walk by, they sneer at me and they say, he doesn't make the grade, he doesn't make the cuts. And Jesus says to him or her, My kingdom is available to you. I see your heart, and even though you haven't been able to keep up with the external purification rites, I see your heart and you're devoted to God and my kingdom is for you. But I also believe that Jesus' word that morning was for some of the Pharisees, some of the religious people who, who strove for that external perfection. It says Jesus, it's as if Jesus was saying to them, my kingdom is for you too. Let go of 
this external righteousness. Let go of these attempts to earn your way into God's favor. Receive me as the king of the kingdom. And God's favor comes upon you in grace and mercy. And so I think God's, Jesus' words and his invitation into the kingdom was also for the Pharisees. And if you turn, you don't have to do it now, but in Acts chapter 16, early, in the early period of the church, we know that Pharisees, some of the Pharisees came into a saving relationship with Jesus. And I wonder if there was a Pharisee on that day, on that mountain, listening to Jesus going, man, there's something different about this guy. Man, He's not doing all of the things that we're required to do by tradition. He's not doing it. And look at the peace that he has in his heart. Look at the relationship that he has with the Lord. There's something different about this Jesus. There's something different. Man, I feel like I can find rest in him. And those are the words of Jesus, right? Come to me if you're weary and burdened. Come to me if you're sick of doing the religious thing. Come to me if you're tired of trying to earn your way to me. It's not about that, Jesus is saying. It's about faith, and it's about just coming to me and finding rest in me and believing me in me as the king of the kingdom. And I think Jesus' words are the same for us today. Maybe you're here this morning and you think to yourself, man, I haven't been able to keep up. Man, I, I feel like I fail every day. I fail at following God. Man, I feel like I'm just a failure and I think people are looking at me and and they're thinking, oh, this person doesn't make the cut, this person doesn't make the grade. Jesus' message for you this morning is my kingdom is for you. Come and find rest in me and me alone. My righteousness is a different righteousness. You can't earn it. It's given to you by grace and it's given to you by a merciful God and all you have to do is receive it. Maybe you're here this morning and you're more like the Pharisees. Maybe you're here this morning and it's easier for you to find fault in someone else's life and to look at someone else's heart and to find error in their heart, in their lives, in their beliefs. And and maybe that's you this morning. Maybe you're that perfectionist who is driven crazy by everyone else's behavior and in a way you don't even like yourself. Jesus' message is for you this morning. His message is, my kingdom is for you. Come to me. Come to me and find rest for your souls. Receive the gift of God's grace and become one of the blessed ones. And the truth of this beatitude is that for every person here who's a follower of Jesus Christ, we have all been there, haven't we? Right? Right? Even little Wesley Wyatt, as cute as he is this morning, he was sleeping so nice before I put that water on his head, right? His heart is sin-stained, you guys. His heart is dirty. His heart is filled with a sinful nature, and it is only by the grace of God poured into him through the work of the Holy Spirit that he will come and have a pure heart. And we're going to pray our hearts out for that, right, Dave and Katrina? We're going to pray our hearts out for that. And we're going to walk with him and we're going to teach him so that someday he's up here and he says, I profess Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, a gift of God's grace, right? We've all been there. Scripture says over and over again that the heart is dirty. Paul says in in Romans 3, no heart is clean, right? No one seeks after God. It is only through the work of the Holy Spirit in us that we can come and have a pure heart. So Jesus says, my kingdom is for you. Well, the second question that we have been using to address the Beatitudes is how are those who have entered into the life of the king called to live, right? It is a description of the Christian life. And we've worked our way through and we've said these are not the, you know, they're not things uh, uh, that get us into the kingdom. We're in the kingdom by God's favor, but how are we called to live, right, in that kingdom, It's a description of the Christian life. When Jesus was talking with the Pharisees and in that Matthew 23 passage, and he would say, woe to you Pharisees, teachers of the law, what was the word that he used to describe them? He would say, you 
hypocrites, right? You hypocrites. Well, that word hypocrites in the Greek means actor. It means pretender. It's someone who is two-faced, someone who one moment has a mask on and appears this way, the next moment he takes the mask off and he's this person. It's someone who is double-minded, right? It is someone who has multiple um, focuses, if you will, someone who has a dual focus. Well, a 19th century theologian by the name of uh, Soren Kierkegaard used this as a definition for pure in heart. He said, the pure in heart are those whose will is one thing. One thing. And that comes from the book of James. In James chapter 4, verse 8, James says, Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So James describes those who do not have a pure heart as double-minded, multiple things that get our attention. And so the opposite of that is what Soren Kierkegaard said. He said it's those who have one, whose will is one thing, one devotion, a single-minded devotion. And we see that in the life of David in Psalm chapter 27, verse 4. David says one thing. Look at this, one thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek. What does he want to do? That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. David's heart was for one thing. David's heart was to be completely devoted to the Lord, completely sold out to the Lord. Do we know that David was a perfect person? No, right? David was a blow it. David messed up all the time, and yet Scripture describes him as a man after God's own heart because the desire of David's heart was one thing. The desire of David's heart was to be in the presence of the Lord all the days of his life. The desire of David's heart was to be completely sold out for him. So pure in heart means a single-minded devotion where the one thing that occupies our mind, our intellect, our emotions, our decision-making is our relationship with God himself. But that's tough, isn't it? That's tough. John Ortberg writes about this stuff. He's one of my favorite Christian writers. And he says, the great enemy of one thing is ambivalence. Ambivalence. And ambivalence is kind of uh, divided uh, attention or, or uh, conflict in your heart. It's indecisiveness, okay? That's what ambivalence is. And it's seen, I think, in a, a good illustration of that is in a, in a, a statement made by St. Augustine. St. Augustine uh, was uh, at a period in his life where he really wanted God to be the one thing, right? He wanted to be wholly devoted to God, but he was afraid of giving up those areas of his life where he found pleasure, okay? And so his prayer to God that St. Augustine writes down is, God, make me chaste, but not yet, okay? Make me chaste, God, but not yet. I'm not quite there yet, God, right? And don't we do that ourselves? Don't we do that ourselves? God, I want to be wholly devoted to you. God, I want you to be the one thing in my life But God, please don't ask me to give up the TV shows or the movies or the music that puts images in my mind that are not pure, that puts words in my mind that are not pure. God, don't ask me to give those things up yet. God, I want to be wholly devoted to you, right? It's like we're we're conflicted there. We want to be intimate with God, and yet we flee from it. We want to be obedient with our money and with our time. We want to be generous to others, but we covet and we hoard, right? We suffer from that as well. The great enemy of the one thing is ambivalence. It's a divided heart. And so John Ortberg, I love it. He said the great friend of one thing then is this. It's the word of God. The great friend of one thing is the word of God. 
Paul in Ephesians chapter five, he's talking about in, a, in the context of marriage, but he uses the relationship of the church as the bride of Christ with Christ as the bridegroom as the illustration. And he says, the new community, right? The community of the blessed ones, those who are living in the, in the life of the kingdom, he says, you are to have the, wa- the you're to have your mind washed by the word every day. It's like putting your dirty laundry into a, into a washing machine, right? And you put some soap in there. And you know, I don't know about you, but my kids, they come home from school and their clothes, especially my younger two, I don't know how my wife does it. I mean, they come out clean somehow, right? But they're just a mess. They're grass stains and they're dirt because they play sports at recess. And, and, uh, and, and so they come out. It's like in the washing machine, that soap, it attacks those stains and it, and it works its way into the fabric of the clothes and it releases those, those dirt, the dirt and it goes out of the washing machine and the clothes come out clean. And that's what the word of God does when we allow it to wash us on a daily basis. When we're in God's word on a daily basis, it renews our minds. It renews our minds and it brings to mind the things of God, not the things of the world. And so imagine, as you see people, the first thought that comes to your mind is I wanna bless them. I wanna pray for them. Imagine you guys, of seeing someone of the opposite sex, maybe someone who's not your spouse, instead of that first thought going to lust, your first thought is, that's a brother or a sister in Christ. Imagine wishing well for your enemies. That's the life of the kingdom. It turns the values of the world on its head and it takes what's wrong and it makes it right. And then we become those people pure in heart, single-minded devotion as we spend time in the word and we allow God's word to wash and renew our minds. And the more we're focused on him, we become people who live out the Shema. Hear, O Israel, love the Lord your God with all your hearts, with all your soul, with all your might, and with all your strength, right? We become people who live the Shema and he becomes everything to us. So single-minded devotion, one thing, called to one thing. And then just quickly at the end, the the beatitude finishes with this incredible promise for those who have pure hearts. They're gonna see God, right? It says you will see God. And I think there's an immediate context for us in that. And there's a future context. And the immediate context is similar to what Moses experienced in Exodus chapter 33, where Moses said to God, show me your glory. And God said, Moses, my goodness is gonna pass in front of you and my name is gonna be proclaimed in your presence, right? And and Moses saw the glory of God. He couldn't see his face, but he saw his back spiritually, right? And he saw the character of God, slow to anger, abounding in love, gracious and compassionate, just, right? He saw God and and I believe that for those whose focus is one thing, we see God all around us. Our eyes are opened. We're given spiritual eyes to see, spiritual ears to hear. And we see God and what he's doing in our lives. And we see God and what he's doing in our church. This morning, a beautiful picture of what God's doing at Cross Point, right? And we say, praise the Lord. We see him working. It's not Pastor Tim and it's not Pastor Brian. It's not Danelle. It's not, it's God using all of us together, right? For his glory and for his fame. And so we see God around us. And then there's a application too as a future application that we will see God in eternity. And I wanna just close with what Martin Lloyd-Jones, such a good writer and was over here saying that he's been reading it with me. And let me read what Martin Lloyd-Jones and then we'll finish here. He says, all I have tried to say can be put like this. You are going to see God Do you not agree that this is the biggest, the most momentous, the most tremendous thing that you can ever be told? Is it your supreme object, desire, and ambition to see God? The time is short. You and I have not long to prepare. The great reception is at hand. In a sense, the ceremonial is all prepared. You and I are waiting for the audience with the king. Are you looking forward to it? Are you preparing yourself for it? 
Do you feel ashamed at this moment that you are wasting your time on things that not only will, will be of no value to you on that great occasion, but of which you will then be ashamed? You and I, creatures of time, as we appear to be, are going to see God and bask in his eternal glory forever and ever. Our one confidence is that he is working in us and preparing us for that. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, I'm reminded again that to live into these statements of Jesus, to live into life of the kingdom is not anything that we can do on our own. God, we can't come into that life on our own. We need the Holy Spirit to move in our hearts. God, and we certainly can't live out these beatitudes on our own. So God, I pray that you would equip us and empower us and encourage us through your Holy Spirit, to be people who desire pure hearts. God, to be people who desire one thing, to have hearts that are wholly devoted to you. God, we confess together as a family of believers that too often we don't have hearts that are solely devoted to you that we have hearts that are divided, divided between you and what our culture says are important, between you and our families, between you and sports, between you and school, between you and uh, our our, uh, efforts to succeed in the business world. God, forgive us for that. And God, I pray that you would encourage us to be a people this morning who say, I'm gonna start again and with the help of the Holy Spirit, I'm gonna be someone who makes God the one thing in my life and that everything else will come out of that, that all of my decisions will be made based on what scripture says as my guide, that I will do away with the things in my life that are bringing dirt and junk into my mind and I'm gonna let the word of God renew my mind on a daily basis. So God, may we be a people of the word. May we be a people of the text. God, renew our minds, awaken our hearts, give us spiritual eyes and ears to see you all around us. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen.
praise team. If you are a, a guest uh, here this morning, we're thrilled to have you with us and we would love to get to know you. Uh, Kaylin talked about those connection cards and that's one way. Another way is for us to meet you in our hospitality room, which is a room right through the doors and to my left. And we would love to meet you there and just hear uh, what God is doing in your life. And, and uh, so please find your way over there. And prayer partners, if you would come forward, if you need prayer for anything after the service, we have men and women up here, uh, intercessors who are gifted in interceding for you uh, before the throne room of God. And, and so if you need prayer for anything, uh, praise, uh, healing, maybe you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the King, uh, come forward and, and one of our prayer partners would love to pray with you. Uh, congratulations and welcome again to those who uh, came into the family of Cross Point today and professing your faith and transfers. We're just so thrilled to have you. So uh, good day. Uh, receive God's parting blessing. Go in his peace. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his glorious face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you his everlasting and abundant peace. Amen and amen. Be blessed. <laughs>